So the title of this sermon is The Battle to Control Self with Self. The Battle to Control Self with Self. Uh, it would be really great if you could read Titus chapter 2 before listening to this sermon. Titus chapter 2. Now, I know it might only be November, but Christmas is on its way. And soon we'll be asking ourselves the question, what gift can I get them? You want to get someone a gift that they like, but because they have so much stuff already, getting something they want proves difficult. Well, here's my advice of what not to get that person. A gift nobody wants to receive at 7am on Christmas morning. This gift is called self-control. Before Christmas dinner, nobody wants to be given the gift of self-control. For self-control would spoil the dinner, spoil the party, and spoil our enjoyment of the January sales. You know, self-control is bottom, bottom of everybody's Christmas list. And yet, it is at the top of everybody's New Year's resolution. By the time January has come, we have either put on weight, got into debt, or regretted shouting at our family over Christmas dinner. Self-control is something we all need. But unfortunately, it's not something we naturally want. So, some questions for the Christian. Is self-control optional or is it essential? Is self-control impossible or possible? Is self-control a work of God or a work of man? So firstly, is self-control optional or essential? When Paul, the Apostle, spoke to a man named Felix about the Christian faith, Paul described the Christian faith in the following way. It's found in Acts chapter 24, verse 25. It says, Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment. Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment. In describing the Christian life, Paul looked back back at being made right with God through faith in Jesus. Paul also looked forward towards the coming judgment when Jesus would come again. Paul looked back and forth between the beginning and the end of the Christian life. And what did Paul see in the middle? What quality did Paul use to describe the Christian life between now and then? It says, Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment. You know, you and I might put self-control at the bottom of our Christmas lists. But it's at the top of Paul's list when it comes to describing the Christian life. For just as you cannot be a Christian without the righteousness of Jesus... And just as you cannot be a Christian without believing that there is a judgment to come, so too you cannot live the Christian life without self-control. It's needed and it's essential at every stage. But why? Why is self-control so essential? Why do we so desperately need it? Well, picture a prison filled with a thousand inmates and a hundred staff. What is the sole task of every prisoner? To escape. What is the sole task of every member of staff? To keep the prisoners in. What would happen if the guards left a window open? A prisoner would jump out. What would happen if one of the cells was left unlocked overnight? The prisoner in that cell would run away. What would happen if the night shift turned off the security cameras and turned tuned in to BBC One instead? Well, by the time the programme ended, the prison would be empty. 
you know, when a thousand prisoners are all trying to escape. No prison guard can let down their guard. And in much the same way, with so many sinful desires running inside, our, our, with so many sinful desires running around inside of us, no Christian can do without self-control. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You know, having a few too many roast potatoes on Christmas Day is the least you have to worry about. Inside of, uh, for inside of all of us, there are over a thousand sinful desires, each one pulling us in the wrong direction and waging war against your soul. You know, open a window to lust and even the most holy of Christians have acted on it. Put no locks on what you say, and we all know that anger and gossip will instantly escape. Fail to guard what you watch, what you think about, and what you listen to, and you will be led astray. That's why Paul describes self-control as essential, for we all have a sinful self that needs controlling. In Titus chapter 2 that you just read from, Paul commands older men to be taught about their need for self-control. Paul commands older women to exercise restraint in what they say and in what they drink. Paul commands younger women to be self-controlled and pure. Paul commands young men to be self-controlled. Paul commands Titus, a Christian leader, to set his church an example in what being self-controlled looks like. Did you hear your name in that passage? Young and old, male and female, Christian for a day or Christian leader for several years. Self-control is essential to all. It's, essential to, it's an essential attribute in every Christian's life. You cannot do without it. Self-control is something you and I all need. So, is self-control optional or essential? It's essential. Is self-control impossible or possible? Self-control is something we all need. But self-control is not something we naturally want. And that's what makes self-control so difficult. When we are angry, we want to express it. When tempted, we want to say yes. When we want to speak, we don't want to hold back and stay silent. When we want something, we are the one who wants it. And we don't want to be told the words, no. You know, self-control is difficult because we, we, you know, we don't naturally want to control ourselves. That's what makes self-control so difficult. You know, to control self with self. To control self with self is like leaving prisoners in charge of locking their cell before they go to bed. To control self with self is like leaving kids in control of what time they start and finish school. If you leave kids in control of what time they want to start and finish school, they'll start at 9am and finish at 9.01. All of these examples are recipes for disaster. Why? Because the person being asked to, is being asked to do something that they do not naturally want to do. They're being asked to comply with something that they don't want. When it comes to self-control, our sinful selves do not want to comply. That's why self-control, using the power of ourselves alone, is always doomed to fail. For example, you may probably be able to relate to some of these examples. I certainly can. I wrote them. We make ourselves rules 
and yet we still break them. We try harder and we still fail. We promise to do better next time, but this only adds to the guilt next time when we don't succeed. Self-control is impossible through the power of self-determination alone. That's why Paul not only tells us what to do, he also points us to how. Paul tells us not only what to do, for example, to be self-controlled, he also points us to how. To Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, that all offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in, in this present age. These verses do not say the commands of God have appeared to teach us to try harder. These verses do not say the guilt of God has appeared to make us feel worse when we fail. No, these verses say, for the grace of God has appeared. It, i.e. the grace of God, is the thing that teaches us to say no to godliness and, to, and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. The grace of God has appeared, and it, the grace of God, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. You know, in other words, it's saying that the grace of God is the starting block to all change. Paul explains this a bit more in chapter 3. Verse 3 of chapter 3 reads like this. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. In other words, at one time, we were all disobedient, repeatedly giving in to our sinful desires. At one time, we were all deceived, unable to see the value of self-control. At one time, we were all enslaved. In regards to sin, we were unable to tell ourselves to stop. At one time, we were all living a life of malice and envy, exercising no self-control in, in our thoughts or in our words. At one time we had no self-control. And then what does Paul go on to say in Titus chapter 3? But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. You know, in Jesus, there was and there always is sufficient grace for when we fail. For the times that you fail to practice self-control, there is forgiveness. At one time we had no self-control, but, verse 5, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Something new happens when someone becomes a Christian. This thing is described as rebirth and renewal. God get God get rid God, sorry God gets rid of the old. That's what Paul means when he said describes the washing of rebirth. God get, gets rid of the old, and God's Spirit ins, instills in us something new. Specifically, new desires and new affections. This is described as renewal by the Holy Spirit. Because of these new affections we want to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Because of these new desires we want to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. When a person becomes a Christian, God's Spirit begins a work of inner change. God changing us from the inside. Now this does not mean self-control is easy. As Christians we all still want wrong, wrong things. 
and we will still struggle to hold back wrong thoughts and words. Self-control is a war in the life of every Christian. But at least with the Holy Spirit's help, we have the, we have the tools to fight back. As Peter wrote in his second letter, His, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life. You know, it's always good to know what areas your areas of weakness are. For our fight to be self-controlled will mostly happen in the areas in which we are weak. So ask yourself, what sins do you find attractive? How do you typically respond to difficult people or situations? What areas are you most likely to go astray in? Your battle with self-control with, with self will probably take place in these areas of weakness. But do not think that you enter the battle without God's help. As Peter wrote, his to God's divine power has given us everything we need for a, life, for a godly life. In other words, self-control is possible despite your weaknesses. Self-control is possible because of the power and the strength that God provides. You know, the words that God spoke to Paul apply to us as well. God spoke to, said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In your area of weaknesses, in your area of weakness, there is always sufficient help. You know, this means none of us can use weakness as an excuse. Nor does our weakness mean we are always doomed to fail. So in summary, so far, is self-control option or optional or essential? It's essential. Is self-control impossible or possible? It is possible because of God's grace. And thirdly and lastly, is self-control a work of God or a work of man? Now, self-control is a lot like a remote control, something we all make use of when watching the TV. You know, with a remote control, we have the power to stop, fast forward, or turn off the TV. With a remote, with a remote control, we have infinite power at our fingertips. But our fingers must make use of that power as well. No TV turns off by itself. Now back to the Bible. Peter writes, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Here Peter reminds us that we all have the power of God at our fingertips. We have everything we need to live a godly life. But what does Peter go on to say in verses 5 and 6? For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. God has made his infinite power available. And yet, those who have faith are still called to exercise every effort. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control. We're called to exercise every effort, not a little effort, not some effort, but every effort. You know, God's infinite power is not an excuse for inaction by us. In other words, self-control is both a work of God and a work of man. Our every effort is involved. So what does this look like practically? What does it look like to depend on God and exercise every effort ourselves? Well, I'll give a few examples. In avoiding temptation. Let's think about avoiding temptation for a moment. Now, picture yourself walking towards a salesman on the high street. What do you do? You avoid eye contact. You walk as far away from them as possible. You keep your hands in your pockets. 
you know, the way to stop the salesman gaining control over your time and your will and your money is by keeping as far away from him as you can. Jesus teaches us to do the same in our fight with sin. Jesus said, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Jesus here uses picture language, non-literal language, to describe the radical steps we should take to avoid temptation. Separating, separating ourselves from temptation as much as we can. We need to do that if we're to succeed in the battle with self-control. For example, a few ways that you can do this. You could fast forward through James Bond sex scenes rather than exposing your eyes to them. You could walk away when, when standing still would put you in the ear, ear's reach of gossip. You could avoid temptation by not entering into an argument where your mouth is very likely to get carried away. These are all ways in which we can avoid temptation. We need to do these things if we're to succeed in the battle to, to exercise self-control. We need to avoid temptation and we need to say no to temptation. No is always the only way to answer temptation. We read in Titus chapter 2, two verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Now in the world of maths you probably know that 1 plus 1 equals 2. In the world of maths, 1 plus 1 equals 2. But in the world of temptation, 1 plus 1 equals 11. For example, King David's one look at Bathsheba led to a second look, then adultery, then deceit, then murder, then lying, then religious hypocrisy. You get the idea. Saying yes to one sinful look led to 11 sins after that. In much the same way, focus on one thing you hate about someone and you'll soon find another 11 things you hate as well. Utter one comment under your breath and you'll soon find yourself arguing for the next 11 minutes. Compromise in one area of life and compromising in another, another 11 areas of life becomes so much easier. You know, in the world of temptation, never say yes to just this once. Never think, I'll do this and then that'll be the end of it. For in the world of temptation, 1 plus 1 always equals 11. When we decide to sin once, we inevitably sin a further 11 times and compromise in another 11 ways. That's why we need to take every advantage of the opportunity to say no the first time around. Thankfully, God gives us the strength to say no. For it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when you are tempted, God will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. So in summary, self-control is essential. We, we, we need to practice it every single day. Self-control is possible because of God's gracious offer of help. Is self-control a work of God or a work of man? It's a work of both. You need God's help and your every effort is required as well.